I'm gonna, I, so, so the thing about having all of people from different parts of my life and gather together is that I kept on thinking about what I was gonna read that people hadn't already heard, and I was like, nope, I, I read that at this place, and nope, I read that at that place. Um, so I think I'm gonna read a story from the collection that I've never read before, so I'll apologize in advance for tripping up, maybe. Um, but also it's kind of fun for me because I get to read something new. Um, the collection is, is called The Age of Perpetual Light. The cover is beautiful, I took it off so you can see that. Um, <laughs> probably shouldn't do that, but my there. Um, and uh, And it's, uh, we'll talk about what the collection is as a book afterwards. I won't fill it in much on that. Um, all, all of my stories, I just, I try to write short stories and they always wind up longer than really short stories. So nothing I have in here is short enough to read an entire story to you. So I'm just gonna read the beginning of something. Um, I was I just, uh, this summer, uh, something that's not in this book is not even done. I thought, I just wanna, I had gone through kind of a tough period of working on a novel and um, I just wanted to write something I could complete. And I had this idea, I was like, it's gonna be kind of short, short, like a thousand words. And I had, it was kind of all based on this just metaphor. I was like, ah, yeah, it's like a short, short anything. Two weeks later, it's like a novella. And <laughs> so yeah, so I don't have anything short enough to, um, to to read the whole. But I'll read from a story, like I said, I've never read before, called Beautiful Ground. Um, the other reason I wanted to read from it is it's set here in New York, um, out in Brooklyn. Um, and I used to live out there, so it is kind of a homecoming for me. Um, so it's nice to be able to do that. It has, um, these kind of inserts, I'm not really sure what the right term for them would be, I don't know if you have a term, but they're like, no, my no, <laughs> they're, they're, they're lifted from, uh, initially, I'm just gonna set this up a little bit so you know, you'll be like, why is he reading this weird thing? Um, it's like two or three lines that separate sections that are lifted from a, uh, a blog that keeps, that's posted by these explorers going into the Arctic. Um, and so they're like data log, and it'll be like just a few lines, like that with some numbers, and it's like longitude and latitude and stuff like that. Just so you know what that is. Um, I just got really nervous because one of my favorite writers that exists in the world just showed up, and uh, one of my mentors and literary heroes. So thank you for making me um, now stumble. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> now I'm like I'm just not. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna read anything. Um, <laughs> I will read this. Um, beautiful ground, um, and I'll just start with that. About 10 minutes. So here's one of these things. I'll do this. Oh, it's one of <laughs> um, for the first time yesterday, we saw shadows. Mike Horn and Borge Ausland, North Pole Expedition, March 23rd, 2006. Now they were setting out together. The two greatest adventurers alive trying to reach the North Pole in the dead of winter, in the Arctic's 24-hour dark, on foot, day after day, no different from night after night, no motors, no dogs, no nothing but the cold and the ice, and them hauling sledges through the ceaseless black. Why, the interviewer asked, would you do such a thing like that? On the radio, laughter. It seemed to Claire to fill the studio apartment, take up what little space there was for her and Todd, Standing in the stream, steam above the stove, she shivered. Behind her, her husband stopped chopping. She knew the way she knew this dinner they'd made together some hundred times over the years, that in the breath between last laughter and the next question, he would say something. Still stirring, she reached back with her other hand, touched her fingers to his lips. What is it that scares you most? The interviewer asked. Moving around each other in the cramped corner kitchen, they listened to the voices of the explorers, our personal limits, squeezing close to make room for a swing fridge door, reaching behind for a saucepan, the psychological effects, occasionally brushing hips, so much time with Borge, this is the guys talking, laughter, with Mike, laughter. There was a time, she thought, when he might have kissed her fingertips, when she might have left them there long enough to let him. Data log. Day 55, latest position, north 88 degrees, there's a bunch of numbers now, 34 longitude, east 83. Distance to go, 160 kilometers, temperature negative 15 degrees Celsius, days of food left, 13, average daily distance required, 13 kilometers. 
Every few days, the men sent word by Sacro. Someone updated the blog. And each evening, she sat staring at the screen while Todd's slow walk preparing for sleep finally said, hitting the sack, then shut off the lamp. She knew he didn't understand equipment, failure, polar bears, their breathless, pitch dark 24 hours a day. You cannot see a thing. But to her, it seemed miraculous. A message from that desperate corner of the earth sent into space, caught by a satellite, directed down to her. She would read it over until the screen went dim and stare into the blackness as if it were a patch of night sky brought back from their life before the city. The stars now replaced by a reflection of the lamp, her desk, three panel divider, divider, the rest of the room that was the rest of their home, her husband unfolding their futon bed, willing her to join him. Once she knew a director had forbade him to speak, ordered him to show what he wanted with just his eyes. Make her feel it, the director had said, make her do it. Stand up, Todd's look said now, come to me. For the past quarter hour, she had been staring out from her sweatshirt hood at the words, first glimpse of the sun, 54 days walking in darkness, 30 in such relentless lack of light, all either of the men had seen was the other's headlamp, all they learned was the other's breath, all they heard was the other's breath steps, until far off toward the rest of the world, the blackness had cracked. A red line of glow like a chink in a cast iron stove. Day by day, a dim light dawning at noon for an hour, then two. The light is fantastic up here. It's bluish violet with a trace of red. The still hidden sun pushing at the curve of the earth, trying to rise. Years ago, in a cave in Mexico, Todd had shut off his headlamp. He had reached to her forehead and shut hers off too. It was so black, he told her. I can't see the hand in front of, I can't see your hand in front of my face. She breathed out, that's because it's not, and felt his fingers, faint as breath, tracing her brow, brushing her eyelid, hovering over her cheek, her mouth. I can see you, he had said. I can see your face in front of my hand. Behind her, the screen divider shook. In a second, he would be there, peering over the blind. She tapped the space bar, the laptop's brightness bloomed. First glimpse of the sun. Anything happened today? His voice was so close it made her jerk. We looked at the temperature gauge at the same time, but there was no change, this is written on the computer. No, she told him, shutting the browser's window. And then her hood was off, he tugged it, and looking up, she couldn't help but grin. What in the world are you wearing? Baby, he said, in his best very white. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Baby, he said, in his best very white, his arms spreading so the cashmere sweater's neck revealed an even wider V of bushy chest. Hugh Hefner, oh no, she said, wears sweaters just like this, he went on. Sorry, I didn't recognize the Hugh Hefner. Moment of silence. <laughs> um, laughing, she stood, stepped around the screen. Below his waist, he wore nothing but briefs, skimpy and light, bought for the backpacking trips they used to take. Wow, she said. He looked at her as if that meant she liked them. No, she told him. And when he said, well, what are you wearing? She looked down, baggy sweatpants beneath a sweatshirt stained from that morning's co-op shift. Reaching back, reached back, replaced her hood, stood there with a sly smile. Come on, he said. You don't know what I'm wearing under this, she said. My boxers, he said. Maybe not, she said. And my t-shirt, he said. Maybe I'm not wearing any underwear. Maybe I won't wear Claire, you have to, he said. It buys you time. It gives you something to take off after you've taken off. Todd, she put her hands on his chest, slid them to his shoulders. We aren't really going to do this, are we? He had small shoulders, as if made to fit her hands. She used to like that. Baby, he said, his voice back to his voice this time. We could just stay home, stay in together. Open some wine, take it to bed. Even after the, these fallow weeks, she could feel how his fingers would stroke her spine. His lips would brush her eyelids, the wetness of his mouth switching from breast to breast. When had his touch begun to feel like it was wearing out her vertebrae? When had the rhythm of his breathing begun to bother her? She wanted to keep her eyes up open, tell him, stay on one nipple, wished, her thighs weren't, wished his thighs weren't so hairy, his shoulders so slim, that the worry would leave his touch, the doubt disappear from his breath. When had his lovemaking become so desperate? When had it begun to make her feel desperate, too? Data log. Day some thousand, some hundred and something. Latest position, Brooklyn. 
Park Slope between 8th and 9th Avenues. Distance to go, God knows. The rest of her life, another year, another night, and in the morning. Sometimes, coming back from work, climbing up the subway stairs, she thought she could feel the ice slipping away beneath her. When they first left their families, their homes flew north for Cape Artichesky. They had felt the wind with them, but by the time they stepped onto the frozen sea, just the two alone, the gusts were blowing against them. The island of ice beneath their feet drifting backwards, pushed so steadily by the sea chop that they would slog a, do that they would slog a dozen hours northwards only to wind up standing farther south. For a year after college, she and Todd had traveled, just backpacks and boots, and a different place to sleep each night, a hammock hung porch beneath a quiet volcano, the two of them swinging in their own cocoon, a sheetless hotel where they had rolled on the floor, dirt pasted to their sweat. Even a mist-thick mountain pasture, him in a saddle, her on his lap, the horse drifting through the fog, the feel of it moving beneath them. They'd come to New York for Todd's career. I'm not getting any younger, he'd said at 24. But she had wanted it too, the dim sun Sundays in Senegalese, and Senegalese in Clinton Hill, mariachis on the subway home, the old Puerto Rican men blasting Juan Tizol from boom boxes in the baskets of, of their bicycles, the documentary festival that left them feeling they had explored the farthest corners of the world. How had it gone from that to this? The reliable wine store, neighborhood tie, the tailor who hemmed all his pants, the stylist who'd done her hair since 98, 97, for six years, they'd been members of the massive food co-op in Park Slope, tri-weekly work shifts wheeling out wet boxes of mysterious greens, smashing the cardboard in the crushing machine, manning the register alongside men in turbans, dreads, tailored suits, making change for women wearing hijabs or with tattoos on their shaved heads, too many to ever learn more than a smattering of their names. At first, it had been almost an adventure. Now it was just what they did some Saturdays if they couldn't find another member willing to swap. A fellow actor who understood Todd's callbacks, a lesbian whose crush on Claire made it look, made it easy to ask. He used to tease her about that. She used to ask how his auditions went. But now every time he came back giddy, Claire knew it was from some connection, some buzz, something he'd felt with someone else. Sometimes in the black of night, fissures would open cracks in the ice. They were called leads and they struck straight down into the sea, the water dark, the depths unfathomable. Sometimes they would appear in the headlamp beams, sometimes they would start to split right between your feet. Snow obscured thin patches of ice, darkness hid a telltale blue. A potential minefield, we have to test the ice cap with our ski poles, tapping the tips in front before we place our feet. And last week after her last class, after she'd come home to the cracks opening all around her and told her husband it wasn't working, they were breaking apart, she didn't want them to. After he had told her, I know, I just don't know what to do. That night, she had not been able to get the words out of her head. It tests our personal limits, Horn Horn had written. The drive to go beyond, it tests our personal limits, mental, spiritual, physical, it tests our personal limits. She had fallen asleep to the sound of his voice, the image of the two men held in her mind. They were putting on their survival suits, zipping them shut over their heavy clothes, sealing their faces behind clear plastic, peering through the stream, a stream of their breath, steam of their breath at the freezing water below, jumping in. I'll stop there. Are we mic'd here now? Is this like, do you all hear? Yeah, we're mic'd. Cool. <laughs> awesome. um, thanks, Josh. Thanks. This is fun. It's good to be here. Josh, we go way back. Um, and that story takes a very interesting turn very soon after that. Um, one of the things that... Us going way back and the story taking the turn. <laughs> it really doesn't have anything Those to do with it. In case you're wondering. No? Yeah. Okay. We did both uh, voluntarily. Um, That's true. That story, I think, and but most in the collection, I feel um, there's a real feeling of isolation and both physical in this story and emotional. Mm. Um, and I feel like your characters, you know, really feel their losses deeply and fear deeply what they might lose mm. across the board. Um, you know, there's a real acute emotionality and I'm kind of curious 
uh, as, a, as a fan and reader of your work, like, what is it about that ground that you like to explore? Yeah, I don't, you know, I think it's, um, I've always, since I was a little kid, just been drawn to um, dramatic stuff. The things that feels like, it has to feel like it has weight, or I'm just not interested in writing. The first short story that I ever wrote that was a, had like an arc, was a complete thing. I was like maybe 10 or 12, or something like that. Of course. And it was, um, it was about a cowboy, because I, I love cowboys. Yeah, I still love cowboys. And, um, and well, I like reading about cowboys. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> just to clarify. But um, I, I um, so, so yeah, it was about this cowboy who got in a knife fight and he killed the guy, it wasn't his fault, and he got uh, ridden down by a posse and they hung him to death at the cottonwood tree. <laughs> I was like 10 or 12, his name was Buck. And, um, and, and uh, you know, there's just something, <laughs> there's something in uh, darkness, but not for darkness sake, but in, in what it does to people having to face their fears, the hard things inside them, how it, how it kind of presses at the rawest emotional places in them. That's what I'm interested in as a writer. Um, and, 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 and because it comes from every story, there's that whole thing like, you know, we ask where, you know, what, how much of this is you and, you know, well, everything's me, or, you know, but I think, I don't know, I don't think that's true for my work, but I think the guts of it is always me because it comes from some uh, deep kind of personal, Pain or wound I want to wrestle with, and and so I do it through through characters, and so that's part of why there's always a focus on that on a character wound. That's where my interest lies in a story, um, and it, it means that because of that I have to put my characters through hell because I'm I'm I'm, I'm interested in taking uh, the kernel of something that happened to me or that feels hard to me and pressing that in a way that will make it almost crack a person the way that I have hopefully have it almost cracked. But it's that almost cracking that's interesting to me. And the drama comes from whether the crack will actually break the person or, or it won't go all the way through, kind of. And there'll be some way to salvage it. And do you know whether the person's gonna break or not, like when you set out to write a story? Yes, I think so. And that's, I mean, I think I'm, I'm especially with short story writers, I think I'm really, um, I run against the grain with that. But for me, my interest, because I'm interested in some, I'm almost always writing towards a moment. And I may, I may, I think I know at least. Sometimes it'll surprise me and it'll happen different. You know, it always happens in a different way, but sometimes that character will react in a way that I wasn't expecting to that moment. But I always know what that moment is that I'm writing towards. I'm not writing from a moment. I think a lot of rich short stories will have, the short story writers will have something that will intrigue them or get, spark them and they'll, and they'll start moving forward from that. Mm -hmm. But right. for me, I'm always interested in reaching that point it comes how do I get to this thing that feels um, because it's too dramatic a thing to start there. Do you know what I mean? I think I actually I wrote um, I think you said there's a screenplay I wrote a long time ago that um, I think it was your criticism of it. Uh -huh. Mike is so, so Mike reads I think every story in here Mike read in draft form and uh, a lot of yeah, some as far back as probably 10, 11, 10 12. years yeah the first story is about 10 years yeah. old um, that's when I first started this collection and um, uh, so this screenplay, though, I remember you said, one of the, and I think you're right about it, it started at a level of kind of fraught pain and difficulty that left it nowhere to go. And I think that's part of why I'm always writing towards that moment, is it feels like if you start right there, it's, it's if you start at, at when, not the crack, but at the crack and open, you know, it's, it's hard to move from there. Yeah, makes sense. yeah, because you're in danger of just melodrama. Right? Yeah, right, right. Which, and so, you know, speaking of screenplays, I know that you studied drama, and I'm curious also how that plays into your, your writing of fiction, both in small and larger forms. Um, I think it plays in a lot. I think my, my um, part of the reason that the stories are long in this collection, and that my stories are long, is that I write uh, always with an arc in mind, with like a dramatic arc that feels narratively like a longer piece and even in the short fiction, it feels to me that way. That's how I work. And that comes from, I think, reading plays, which you consume in one sitting. You know, I love to read them even more and see, see them. But you can get this full kind of movement of moving through a story and its arcs and its beats and its acts in, you can read that in an hour. 
you know? And so um, even in shorter stuff, I think I'm always kind of working in that mode. Um, and then the other thing too is dialogue. I was talking with a writer friend a little while ago um, about how important musicality is to me in, in my language and in the, in the narration. But it's equally important in the dialogue. And I think that comes from, you know, the playwrights who I love are Pinter and Sam Shepard and another another name uh, for a moment of silence, and um, which I didn't give him, um, but uh, uh, later. Um, sorry, Sam. And, and um, But, you know, these writers who, the rhythmic back and forth of the dialogue, the way that it works has a musicality to it that excites me in writing fiction as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, what does writing short stories actually give you that writing longer pieces doesn't? Um, a few things, I think. I think that it, I use almost all of these in, in between writing one and one. So I write a draft and then I, I need to step away from that draft to be able to clear something, clearly see something. And, and, and short fiction, one, it just gives you that ability to finish something, have that rush, go through that full experience of feeling like you've got something completed and it's sustained. To have that in a way that working on a novel for three, four, five years, uh, I think you just need these moments of sustenance that way. And so they help in that. I think more important than that, I feel like I can experiment with the form so that I'll often try to tackle something that was a weakness of mine in a way that I would be, frankly, just scared to do to devote three, four years of my life on a, a novel to saying like, hey, can I do this, you know? But with a short story, so for instance, in here, there's a short story that covers an entire woman's life from the uh, time that she's I think, three years old till she's about 70. Um, and it's, it, it covers all that time and it, it's written in a strange way, almost entirely in summary. It kind of is like moving very quickly through moments without allowing this expansion into scene. And I knew that some of my my weaknesses I, are covering a great deal of time. I always want to try to fill in. I'm like, well, how you know? How can we just jump ahead to the next month? What did she do in the month in between? You know? So it's like, so that's who always cares? yeah. Who cares, right? But I care, and so I'm like, you know, so I'm like, I know it's a weakness of mine. So I was like, I wanted to do that, and I know that my tendency is also always to break, like, give every moment its full scene. You know, I want to like. I feel like I don't want to rob moments of their dramatic potential and the fullness that they deserve. And so, and so, I wanted to do something where I said I'm not going to allow myself to either of those. So that's just an example of a way that I can use a short story form as a way to try to push myself and break myself with maybe some of my crutches. At what point does the the form of the story come to you? And like, are you pursuing that the same way that you're pursuing the characters in, in the narrative? Yes, I am. I think that almost, so I've, I've found, and this has changed after graduate school. I know you have some students here from Columbia, fellow Lions, was it? I don't yeah. remember, but, um, but yeah. So, um, so in Columbia, graduate school uh, was a big shift for me with that. And, and I think before graduate school, I was just interested in character and story. And that was really where my heart was. And, and I, I, had, I had been drawn to language as well, but form, wasn't as exciting to me. Um, now I find that I need to, in order to be fully invested and excited about a project, I need to first have a real, you know, that, that core connection with characters around some kind of wound and hurt the character is dealing with is, is the most vital thing. But I also find that I now need to have something in the form that feels like a challenge to me, that feels like it's fresh to me, that feels like it's, it's going to um, shake up my approach to narrative. And, and this is in large part, um, I'm gonna embarrass Christine in the back again, but um, you and I both took an independent study with Christine years and years ago um, when we were in grad school. And it was the most important class that I took while I was at Columbia. And um, that was all about looking at narrative fiction that walked right up to the line of being experimental in a way that didn't feel like a story anymore, but didn't cross that line. Still felt like a story, but was working in a way that we that was not how you normally expect narrative to work, right? right? And, and that had a huge impact on me. And so I'm always interested in trying to now think, like, what can I do that is going to um, challenge me in my kind of my, my usual ruts of how I approach narrative, how, you know, what's going to get me out of that, right. including the short stories in the same way. Yeah, and in that class or that independent study, we, you know, I think had this sort of 
question hovering over everything, which was, if it's not a narrative question that is dragging you, you know, pulling you through the text, what is it? Like, why keep reading? Right. In, in, in these sort of difficult books. And, right. And if we and discovered interesting things. We did, and I will let you, I'll clean you all in yes. on the most interesting thing that we discovered. Because um, for me, this was, this was so vital. The more daring the book was going to be in, uh, in, 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 in its approach to all kinds of uh, experimental language or whatever it was going to do, the more important it was, if it was going to still feel like a story, that it had a spine, the stronger the spine had to be and the more simple the spine had to be. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. There was like this, you'd look at something like, um, I'm just going to name some of the books that we just throw them out there. So like, um, uh, um, as I lay dying, right? We would look at, okay, is, like, is there a narrative question that drives this, you know? And it probably seems like it's pretty complex, you know, yeah. right? But anybody who's read that, a narrative question that drives as I lay dying? Anybody? And that, we did, we had to do a whole class, but it was, um, <laughs> but um, it's well, just, it's simply, is will they bury the mother? Right. Right, like that, that it's covers the, it, it's really, it's just it's expressing and it's very simple. Yeah. And, and, and we got to like, or Virginia, I remember Virginia's Wolves to the Lighthouse. To the lighthouse. Yeah. What's the narrative question in that, for those of you who read that? It, it's will they get to the lighthouse? Yeah, the question right? is, like it's so, it's so simple. And, and there's something about like this rock solid simplicity of it that allowed for this freedom, this great freedom in every other aspect of how you approach the work. Because you know like, I got that, like, they're not going to forget that. That's you know that's like a pretty easy one. You know, so it's like that was just hugely influential um, yeah. for me. And so yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I said earlier, I think that, you know there's an emotionality to your work, but I feel like emotion. You know, we talk about the characters and how they narrate form, but I feel like emotion and actually evoking emotion is, I would say, a primary concern for you. Yeah. And it's, it actually comes through in, in all the stories uh, as strongly as narrative. And I still remember once when I when I first read Bridge Weather, uh, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. Uh, Josh's novella was in his first collection, and uh, I finished, and I said, I think you might might have asked how I liked it or whatever. And I said it was really sad. And Josh goes, Good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was struck at the time, and I still am. As why that was good. Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, yeah, you said like, like evoking emotion is as important as narrative to me. Honestly, for me, I don't see the point in narrative if it's not today. Like for me, I just, there's, they're not, um, they're not on top. Um, I, I just think it's why I read, it's why I'm interested in stories. And if it doesn't move me, it might move me in a way that's make, you know, it's really funny or whatever it is, but I'm just not really capable of doing that. I kind of know my limitations. I've tried and it hasn't worked. You've read some of the things that haven't, haven't worked. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, it is all about kind of in service of trying to, to reach, uh, evoke some kind of emotion in the reader. Because that's what matters to me when I'm writing it. Like, if I'm not feeling overwhelmed by some emotion by the time I get to the point in the story where that's the purpose of the story in, in that moment, I know the piece is in trouble. You know, and that's not because I'm like, I think it's some brilliant thing. It's just like, if it's not even affecting me, then I haven't done my job, you know? So, um, yeah, that is, it's just, it's not separated for me. Um, yeah. Um, let's talk about process a little bit. Okay. Because uh, for those of you who don't know Josh intimately, um, he's nuts when it comes to writing. <laughs> yeah, it's like a very, uh, just a very interesting uh, approach to writing. And, you know, he's had, three books in a fairly short period of time. And, uh, for those of you also who don't know, he's got enough stories and novellas to fill two more books. Uh, and, you know, uh, other novel, uh, you know, partially finished novels. Sorry, I'm maybe sort of no, saying cool. you don't want me to say No, that's but. right. Failed books. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, a lot of failed books. Yeah. No, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of material. And, you know, I know your writing process, and I think it's really amusing. Uh, I get a lot of mileage out of it. I'm also, you know, in awe of it, honestly. So, you know, um, what is it that you have to do as, as when you are writing? Well, so this is the thing I, I'll say first. Um, I am, am jealous of writers like you because I know, you know, Mike will like. I know a number of writers who who can 
you know, be at work and then like go to the bathroom for like 10 minutes and like scribble out a paragraph, right? You know what I mean? And then like, I do my best writing in the bathroom. <laughs> and, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and um, but, but I just, I, in a way I got spoiled by the freedom that I had in life when I was younger and learning to write. And I, I was very, I wasn't tied down by anything. And I also was just, I think, um, selfish. You know, so when I think about it, I mean, my, my first writing, I was actually in a relationship. I always say, like, I learned to write when I wasn't in a relationship, but I was. I just was ignoring that relationship. And, um, and, and I would just hunker down and just throw myself into this world of the book and, and work on it. And it's just how my mind learned to, to think about writing. So I need now to create a space around me that is so focused on the fictional world and is not interrupted by anything that's breaking it apart and, 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 and can exist that way for a long period of time. And I've fought that for a long time. I thought, oh, I shouldn't need that. That's spoiled of me. And it is, but it's also just the truth. Like, I just know that's how I work. So, um, so that makes it hard. That means I really, I feel like I can't sit down and write if I don't have like eight hours. You know, like it's, there's no point. I just won't do it. I'd rather not write for a week and then have like three solid days where I do nothing but write. Um, so, uh, because of that, I have all of these, life doesn't want me to do that usually, especially now that I have a family and, you know, and all that. And, um, and so because of that, I, I have all these kind of ways that I try to give myself that space. And, and that means that, you know, I, at this point, they, they build over the years. So, I have, so at this point, I have, to, I have to start writing before it's light. Like, it's driving my wife crazy. But if it's like, if it's dawn or it's like, you know, 6.30, the sun's up, I'm just like, ah, fuck it, face you know, like, you know, like, really? But, um, so yeah, so I have to, like, get up and, like, be out and, like, not talk to anybody, roll out of bed, have my coffee, I get my coffee, I have my half-calf, half, exactly right, half decaf, half caffeinated, because I drink a lot of it, and, and, um, and I put it in my thermos, and I have a slice of toast, one slice of toast, butter or jam, not both. See, he knows me. <laughs> Butter or jam, because both would be decadent. And so, um, so yeah, so I have uh, a slice of toast, and I take it with me down to the trailer that I write in. I used to write in a cabin in Virginia and hope to again, but right now I'm writing in a little 1959 old trailer. It has no internet, no phone reception, none of that stuff down on a creek. Um, I walk down there while it's still dark, and um, then I have earplugs that I put, even though I'm down like on a creek in a trailer. I put earplugs in, I have to wear a hoodie that covers my, gives me like a little, you know, tunnel. And, um, and I used to, when I was first, when I, when I first got crazy about this stuff, I wore, I had, I had a pair of writing socks. They were like fuzzy writing socks. Um, but the problem with that is you have to wash them. Or if you don't, okay. it's a problem. So, so now I'm writing slippers, and I wear different socks inside the slippers, which solves it. And and um, and I have a mug that I travel with, uh, which is a mug my brother gave me, and it's like an old diner mug thing. So I have all of these different things. Um, oh, it's just like a classic white. It's like a uh, classic yeah. white, yeah, like heavy right. diner mug thing. Um, and uh, yeah, and I all of this is really just about trying to trick my mind into be, getting to the right place where I can let go of the rest of the world and exist in the world that I need to to focus on the writing. And so now that I've moved out of California, I do like a breathing meditative thing because it's California. And so, um, have to. Right, so, so I actually do this thing now. But again, also because it's gotten, this has gotten harder and harder for me. It used to be quite easy for me. I used to like be like, see ya to the world. I'm going down to my dad's cabin off the grid. I'll be back in like two months and then just forget about everybody. This is in Virginia. This is in Virginia. Yeah, yeah. Soup, yeah, like cans of soup. It's like spring water, wood heat. It's like, you know, I wouldn't see anybody literally for, for weeks at a time. Um, and, and so there was nothing to take me out. Now that I have a two and a half year old boy and a 14 year old stepdaughter and a family and all, it's, it's much harder to get there. And um, so I do this meditative thing, which is um, for any of you who is, it works great. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start a class on it. No, um, but it's it's really simple. I just sit there and I, I I breathe in and try to picture the 
the room or whatever it is that the scene is taking place that I know I'm trying to start writing. I picture the environment of that scene when I'm breathing it. And then I breathe out and I think of something that is picking up my mind, something that is worrying me, something that is, you know, and I'll do that. And just, it's probably just the slow process of breathing that does more than anything else. But, but I'm also, it's, this, it's, it's almost like, I feel like I'm getting closer and closer stepping into the room where I'm going to write because I'm, I'm re-visualizing that each time I'm taking a breath in, you know, and, um, and it just kind of puts me in the place. So, yeah, and then ideally I, I have like a week where I don't see anybody. Right. But um, that's hard now. So. <laughs> and what's the longest stretch that you've ever sat in and written? Um, uh, I mean, without any break at all, yeah. like, um, I mean, I'd probably well, I probably. Well, I mean, you take a break. But yeah, like I'll I'll, 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 I'll like collapse yeah. on the floor and like nap for twenty minutes and like you yeah. know. So if you include that, um, then you know, I, then it's not usually. I'll go from like you know. You know, you know, long, it would be something like from four in the morning to like three in the afternoon or something like that. And then, but but when the times are good, from back in the good old days, um, <laughs> like I would, the, the whole thing is this: if you include as part of the writing process, like eating something and going for a run and clearing your head for a couple hours and then going back into it, then I would say like three weeks without stop. Right. You know what I mean? Because it would just be, and that's that's that's. That's what I guess. Like that's what I love, and it's and and it's um and so and everything that I've written that I think has been at all successful has been written in some way in that manner. So that um, because it's 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 once I can get rolling on something, it might take me a year to get rolling on something. But once I get rolling on something, if if I cannot stop, I can write to the end. Do you know what I mean? But if I have to stop, then it might take me another week to get back in. Do you know what I mean? It's like that's the for me the thing. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it's you know, see, it's it's nuts, but it's uh, it's also admirable. I would like to say, just to put it on perspective, that Kent Haruf wrote in his basement with a paper bag on his head. Yeah. So, right. so yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> you know, one other thing in, in your collection, and probably I would say in all your work, um, is the, that comes through is the uh, connection the characters have uh, to the natural world around. And you know uh, some stuff that's you, you know the story you actually mentioned starting out to write very short and I've read it and it's longer you know that's very prevalent in that and um, you know it's what the Great Glass Sea is really about and so many stories in here it's about you know uh, the the natural world the dangers of you know what we might lose but also characters attempting to carve out their own way of living in it, and, and, and often in the most wildest of the natural world. And I know that you have a relationship to the natural world, but it's, it's also shifted and changed as you've you know, grown up. And I'm curious just as like where that started for you, uh, you know, and, and where it's at now. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely true. I think that all of my characters, you know, you find these, um, you, I think like, I always think I'm writing something very different from the last thing I wrote, and in many ways, on the surface, my books, all three books, are very different. From, but they all do have this aspect of kind of not fitting in in the world and in society, and um, struggling with that. And the natural world is often an escape from that, an escape from that pressure, and a place that it's kind of easier to fit in. And, and that probably just comes from from me, you know. I mean, I, in a way that I don't. Um, I'm very comfortable, like I have good buddies, I have, you know, it's not like I don't, but at the same time, the, the, it's easiest for me to find happiness the more stripped down my life is, and the more that it's, you know, when I'm at that cabin in Virginia, I'm fully happy, unless the writing's going badly and I'm miserable, but, <laughs> but in general, just, you know, it, it's so easy to find happiness from like, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this because they're making fun of me about it, but like, a hot, Sweet potato. I knew you were going to say sweet potato. I know. <laughs> Nobody has ever got more enjoyment out of sweet potato. Than that's so good. It's like like a cold day, right? Yeah. And I just picture it, right? Like it's, it's like this, yeah, it's like it's like forty degrees out, and it's icy up on the ridge, and like and I walk up the ridge, and I put it like a sweet potato in the microwave. Oh, right? microwave. Just blow it. I know. It's called. You know. It's not. Yeah. There's a little microwave there. So I put a sweet potato in the microwave, and you heat it up, and it's hot, and you have to like. 
toss it between your hands, you know, and you're like <laughs> walking through the cattle pastures and it's all like freezing out and you're talking to yourself like a crazy person because you're talking while you're writing and you're, like, you know, and then like, and you can like hold the sweet potato. Like and then, a lightsaber. <laughs> you can, you know, I said, you know, all I'm just saying is like these simple things, like it gets pared down to, and I just get this great pleasure, like the sweet potato tastes amazing. And it's like, you know, and, and so in a way, just the further that I can pull myself out of society and relationships in it, the easier it is to be happier. Not, I think it's actually, I think it's kind of a limited and pinched kind of happiness compared to the happiness you can have in relationships and with people. And so it's not, I'm saying those aren't worth it, but it's just easier, it's less complicated. You know, um, and so there's always this element in my work, I think, that is, there's a safety in that, that is in nature, that the characters are drawn to, um, and maybe away from society and towards nature because of that ease, there's that pull. So maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Um, should we open it up to uh, the room? Totally. Any questions? Or we can just drink wine. Right. <laughs> So I'm just curious, Josh, what's your relationship with your smartphone? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, boy, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I I am totally tied to my smartphone now. I was like the last of my friends, I think, to get, well, just to get a cell phone, and then um, I got a smartphone a few years ago. Um, very, you know, begrudgingly. Very begrudgingly. And now I'm like totally tied to it, you know, and it's like, and, and, I, and I think it is, I, I, honestly, I just, I think they're terrible. I think they're terrible for our life. I, I, I'm totally, I rely on it completely now, but I think they're terrible. And I th just think, you know, it, it is constantly picking at your brain. It's like you go to check the time and there's an update from the New York Times or something. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and, and it just means even the, the headspace just to think about work in any long way, and, and even just to pay attention to the world. I mean, I have, so I have this two and a half year old boy, he's almost three, and um, he'll say to me, he's, you know, we're, we're desperately trying to keep him away from screen and stuff right now, it's just how we're doing things. But like, it's hard, because we're always on it, right? He knows, we're, you know, it's like, why the hell can't he be on it? And, um, but, um, you know, he'll say to me, like, put your phone away, Dad. <laughs> and it's the worst feeling. You know, you just feel like, like I'll be hanging out with him in his room, and I'm like, Oh, he's like he's playing. I just got him a typewriter, right? So this is this is the, so so I got him like a, like a little like 1980s uh, like Commodore or whatever, you know, like some typewriter. I can't remember what it is. And and uh, you know, you can turn on. He's already totally figured it out. He'll feed the paper in. He'll like turn the thing, and he does the thing like ding, and the thing goes. You know, he loves it. And his favorite thing. I'm getting off track. I'll promise I'll, I'll bring it around. Um, but uh, actually, it's too long a story to be worth it. Um, so so he has the he, so he you know he has a typewriter, and I'll be like, oh, he's like. By itself, and there'll be this like moment where I'll sit there and I'll watch it, you know, be like, oh, that's nice, he's trying himself. And then, like, 50 seconds later, less, 15 seconds later, I'm like, well, I guess I can see what's going on in the New York Times, you know, whatever, you know, I've got emails coming in, he's, you know, catch these couple minutes, and then he's like, turns around, and he's like, Dad, put your phone away, and I'm like, uh, you know, I just think it's, it's terrible. So, so I, I, I am, my, my wife is stronger about this stuff than I am. And she would like to like get rid of smartphones and have no internet in the house. Yeah. And we live out in the country, so, you know. So it's like, but I'm pretty close to saying like, okay, you know, like I'll I'll ride my bike into a cafe, check an email once a day. That probably would work. You know. Yeah, I think it's you know. Oh, sorry, that set me off. But yeah. um. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Hi. Um. So the process that you were talking about sounds really fascinating and both fascinating and terrifying. Um, and the idea of revision just sounds so crushing in the midst of that. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the revision process? I think, I mean, you, you hit on something important there because um, another way that I run against the grain of a lot of writer friends I know is I really believe in a first draft. Um, and, and it's like I, a solid first draft. A solid first draft. And I think if the for me, this is not for writers and gentlemen, but for me, if that, if, there, the, if that first draft isn't close to being right, and it's in the life that's in it, in like, you know, in like the heart of it, um, I don't think I can, re I don't think I can find that in later drafts. There's something about the subconscious and in, in the way that works in that first draft. And so because of that, um, that's part of why I go through this whole crazy process is I don't feel like I can fake it through my way through a first draft. And that's not to say, a lot of writers have, you know, I, and 
great writers will be like, I, I just know it's gonna be a shitty first draft. I'm just gonna like write it out and get the story down, and then I'm gonna like you know make it into something good after that. And it just I know I can't work that way. So I, at the same time, I know that when I like I've never written like a perfect first draft. It's not possible, right? So I try to get as close as I can to something that feels honest and right and true in its guts in that first draft because I do think there's a life in that in that in that first draft. And then revision is really hard, and 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 um, I love tweaking. Like revision in the sense of like, can I tighten this scene up? You know, can I like, that's easy for me. But like, this whole scene isn't working. I have to reimagine it entirely and write a new one. Um, it's super hard for me. It's because I have to kind of like trick my body and mind back into that first drafty kind of place. And yet my body knows like he already did this once. <laughs> you know, and um, and there's a way that even later in later drafts, although I know the replacement scene is the right one for that draft, and it's what makes the book work, and it wouldn't work in a different way. Part of me still feels like, but the real one is the one that's no longer in there. Do you know what I mean? Like, it didn't work for the book, but that was the real one. That was the first first one. So it's hard, you know? Um, and, and the other thing about this kind of submersive process is when it's not going well, when I'm struggling with revision or, you know, it's, um, it's I think, in some ways, I don't, I don't think it's any harder than for any writer, but, um, it, it drives me a little crazy because I'll be down there for you know eight, 10, 12 hours and have written like one sentence. <laughs> it works, you know, and and it's it's horrible. So if you can if you can do it a different way, totally do it. Like you know, I mean, I really I, I don't know that it's you don't it's recommend. Good one. I'm not sure I recommend doing it. No, it's just you know. Yeah. But you do a fair amount of um, planning before yes. before you start. Right. Yeah, and that's and that's just for the same reason. It's that I'm terrified that you know that I'm going to waste that first draft life, and so I I will think about something for a year and take notes. And by the time I go into writing, I actually have it kind of mapped out uh, the way I think it's going to be. It ends up changing, of course, as I'm working on it. But I have to feel like oh, like this is I have a hand on the story and where it's going and the scenes that I'm most excited about and where they go, or else I feel like I'm going to kind of tap into that really special place that I'm always trying to get at and failing off and then I'm going to finally get at it and it's going to be like the wrong thing. Like that sucks. Do you know what I mean? So it's, so, so I'm very kind of protective of that and that's, that's why I plan out. Yeah. Even with, even with short stories, yeah. which sounds silly, you know, in a way, but it's like, even with short stories, stories are 50 pages. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Another question. It won't be about the phone. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, so when you're uh, in your zone, like in your trailer, or in your cabin in Virginia, are you also reading other people's books? No. Um, well, that's not true. Lately, I've been reading, I'm reading research, typically, but... Um, pertaining to your work. Pertaining to my work. So, so I'll, you know, and often research that is not just, that, that is tonally kind of research, so that I might be reading, um, you know, I was working on something set in Appalachia in the 40s, in a very rural Appalachia, and so I would read these, these letters and first-hand kind of accounts of people who were from the same time period. You know, I mean, trying to like just keep in the, that place. Um, I, if I do read fiction, and this is harder as it, as I have fewer times to read bursts, but if I'm working in a long burst like that, I'll try to read the same author. So I might read, um, you know. Uh, I might read, say, Jim Harrison, and just say, I'm just gonna read Jim Harrison while I'm doing this, because I know I'm gonna be affected by what I'm reading, and I kind of pick an author that I feel like I want that, his spirit looking over me while I'm working on this. Um, so I'll do that sometimes. And I know there's some writers who I just can't read. If I try to read Cormac McCarthy, I'm gonna write bad Cormac McCarthy. Like, it's just kind of, you know, I know there's some writers who just have a voice that will affect me in a way that I won't do well with. So I just, I have to wait until I'm not writing to read. Anybody else? Yes. Maybe totally off base, but can you talk a little about your drawing in connection with your writing? Is there a connection? Yeah, sure. Um, this book doesn't have drawings in it. The other two do. Um, and I, I guess I would just say that um, I have always thought visually, and, and in, even in telling stories, I always kind of have to visualize it first. And often that's stuff that has to get cut in my writing because um, I'm spending too much time kind of 
painting the world, um, but that's how I get into it. And so um, with the drawings, it's in some ways an extension of that. Um, in some ways, um, it's a way of when I talk about formally things that interest me, I'll think about a line break or something, you know, how you break up sections or moments in, in, uh, in a story and can you do that, can I do that with the drawing in a way that will work differently, that will have a more fluid feeling and will, will add a kind of a meaning to the white space. Does, does that make sense? So I, I'm usually thinking of it in context of how it, how it affects the feeling of the page um, when I'm doing it. Those early uh, stories that you wrote about cowboys and whatnot, did you illustrate uh, some of them? Or? Were you writing and drawing at the same time? I probably was drawing cowboy stuff. I think. Um, <laughs> I, and you know, maybe it goes back to that. Thinking about it, like I, I, uh, I'm just thinking of these, these first books. There were these like there was a uh, uh, autobiography of a Bronkbuster. I don't remember what it's called, but it was illustrated, right? Like it had like pictures of him like on his like his horse, horse and stuff, you know. And maybe it goes back like all the way to that. But I was, you know, that was the stuff that. When I got really interested in writing, it was through Western stuff, just because. Mm -hmm. And then the the last thing I'll say is like I can pinpoint the book that was the transition towards literary fiction out of that stuff, and it was Ron Hansen's Desperados. If anyone's read it, um, and it was I remember I was probably like fourteen or fifteen, something like that, and I remember like there here was this like cowboy story about these like outlaw brothers, and it was also. <coughs> But I got equally excited by the sentences mm -hmm. and the imagery in that, and it was the f I, I remember that being the first time that that happened. And I remember like lying in my bed. I had a little lamp with a little horse head, like a little horse head, <laughs> and, and uh, I remember like, lying in my bed and just like getting so excited about the sentences that I was reading there. And and it was that that was the shift for me. I have a fourteen year old stepdaughter. I keep on waiting for that to happen with her. I'm like, no more crappy YA things, <laughs> fantasy things, like when's that shift happening? But, um, <laughs> well, a short time after that, didn't you write your own um, Western novel when you were still in high school? I did. I did. <laughs> um, we should probably wrap it up. I feel like it, um, it's been awesome. Let's Thank you all wine. so much. Let's have some wine and keep talking. And, and um, it's amazing to have such a great crowd of people I love and know. Uh, and those of you that don't, like I said, thank you. Thank you.